Yeah, there are certain places where you should be worried. Like if you don't have a skill that is not replaceable, like, it, it, you know, in a lot of ways, it kind of brings us full circle to like this unmistakable concept. Like what is it that makes you stand out so much that nobody can compete with it, not even a machine? I am here today with Srini Rao, who's the host and founder of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, which has been described by your podcast listeners as essentially TED Talks meets Oprah. You've interviewed more than 1,300 people, ranging from bank robbers to billionaires, a very, very short list of some of your guests and the scale of which your conversations range. Glenn Beck, Tim Ferriss, Seth Godin, Cal Newport, like 178 times. I don't, it's hard enough to get people like Cal Newport or Greg McKeown once. You've got them multiple times. Um, and I will also say that I'm very excited about the fact that yours truly is one of the distinguished guests that has been on your podcast, and that's how we connected. And the place that I actually want to start is I want to read a passage from your book that you wrote a few years ago to start a foundational conversation about what it means to be creative in the 21st century with all this emerging technology, some of the challenges that creatives face. And then I would guess that knowing the way that your brain works and the way that my brain works and the way that we're wired, we're going to go in 27 different directions and come back to home base by the end. But there's a, a passage that I think is really, really important to read from your book. But before I do that, I am remiss if I don't say thank you for being here and taking the time to share your insights and your genius with my audience. Well, oh, my pleasure. It's it's very rare. It, funny enough, I don't get interviewed that often. And yet, like I have basically, you know, encyclopedia of information that I need to get out of my head. So this is great. I, you know, it's a rare opportunity for me to be on the other side. Yeah. And I, I love the process of interviewing other people that have interviewed so many experts, because just like you said, um, somebody would go to your podcast and they listen to the experts but they're not necessarily hearing your aggregated perspective of having so many of these conversations, either just from your own memory or from your ability to collect all this information using AI and all these new tools, which we're gonna talk a lot about very, very soon. Uh, but before we get into the weeds of all the technology and all the cool new things that are available to make us better creatives or talking about the existential crisis of doing creative work on the flip side of it, there's a really important uh, phrase that you have in your book, um, the, the art of being unmistakable. And this to me kind of frames where I want to start. And then we're going to just be off to the races. And this is really the foundation of a lot of the work that I do too, which is why I think you and I are such a good fit for this conversation. And the, the phrase goes as this, most people are afraid. Most people get comfortable in a life that seems tolerable enough. They don't have the time, they complain, and they may actually believe it, even as, even as they spend hours watching TV, playing video games, surfing the internet, going to the mall. The price is that moment near the end. By the end, we mean when you realize at the end of your life that your life never belonged to you. You never stepped up, you never owned it, you never showed us who you really are. If this doesn't just encapsulate who you are and the absolute enterprise you have built of all of these great interviews of all these brilliant minds. I don't know what does. So I want to start at the beginning of this conversation talking about what it means to not only be a creative, but what it means to be an unmistakable creative. Yeah. Well, it's funny to hear you read that quote because it's from so long ago. I, mean, I wrote that book God, in 2013. So like that, the book is 10 years old. Um, and I like, it's funny cause I didn't even remember the, until you read the very last part. I was like, I wrote this, like, this doesn't sound like something I wrote, but, um, well, well let's talk about the, the notion of what it means to be a creative first. I think that one thing that we have to, you know, dispel is this notion that, uh, what it means to be a creative is to be a painter or to be a writer or the things that typically label as creative, because, we do creative things every single day. Like we come up with creative ways to organize our days. We come up with creative ways to do the dishes. We come up with creative ways, you know, to, to have my mom, you know, leave me alone. Like for, I'll give you an example. So my mother is notorious for wanting everything in the house to be a certain way. I'm at my parents' house because my sister had a baby about four months ago. So I, I camped out here for paternity leave and they're gone to India for a month. So I was like, okay, why would I pay rent if I can just stay here for another month? Um, but she had, you know, this thing, she's like driving me crazy. I am notorious for leaving the, cap on the toothpaste. And, you know, this is a conversation between all sorts. Like, I told you a thousand damn times to put the cap on the toothpaste. And 
you know, after a thousand times, like initially I'm like, well, you told me a thousand times, like, don't you think this is going nowhere? Tell my dad, you're a scientist. Like any scientist who tested this hypothesis would be like, my son's an idiot. You know, um, he's not going to change. So what I did was I was like, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I was like, like, what is a way that I could avoid having to remember putting the cap on the toothpaste? Now people will think of this as lazy, right? Like anybody else knows like, damn stream, just put the cap on the toothpaste. Like your mom says. And I thought to myself, there's got to be a better way. And so what did I do? I went to Amazon and I'm like, okay, how do I deal with this problem? And I was like, oh, I could literally get a toothpaste dispenser that literally does that. I never have to ever hear this from my mom again. That puts an end to the problem. That's a, a stupidly simple example of thinking creatively about the dumbest thing in your life. So the, the notion that you know only artists are creative is ridiculous. Everybody is creative. There's just something I often say is that the only difference between people who believe they're creative and those who don't are the people who truly believe they're creative are in the habit of expressing their creativity on a regular basis in some form or another. And whether you realize it or not, you're always expressing your creativity uh, in some form or another. Like, you know, if you cook, you're being creative. Like my mother is this amazing cook. That's something I learned when I, I did the research for my second book was that everybody in my family actually was incredibly creative. Like my dad's a prolific photographer. He's creative. But the thing is, even though he's a professor in plant pathology, like he doesn't identify as a creative because in our world, the language that we use basically determines our identity as creatives when it really shouldn't. We over identify with labels. And when you start to basically identify with the label of, oh, I'm a this or I'm a that, that label in and of itself becomes a limitation. Right. Yeah, and I think that, that for me, that, and I love that you brought this up. It's I swear to God, it's like you have my notes in front of you. We're, we're, I have a feeling you and I are going to be on the same wa wavelength the entire time. Um, but to me, it's the difference between I'm creative versus I'm a creative. There's a yeah. giant chasm between those two ideas. One is, well, this is a process or these are things that I do, but it's not who I am versus, oh, no, this is who I am. And that label can just completely change the trajectory of your life, of your career, of the way that you feel about yourself, of your self-worth. So talk to me about the difference between, oh, yeah, I'm creative versus I am a creative. Because I'm sure that you've talked to many people that identify <laughs> on either side in your many conversations. Well I don't remember where I read this, to be honest, but it was this difference between um, having to, you know, a verb versus a noun or a verb versus an adjective, right? I'm a creator is sort of the verb person, right? The creator is the person who does, shit, you know, they make shit happen. Like creator, basically, if you want the diff you want to say the difference between a creative and a creator, I would say is you can see what the output is when somebody is a creator, Whereas somebody who's a creative can be like, I'm creative, and they might have nothing to show for it. It's kind of like the difference between the adjective and the verb. One is basically driven by action. So the person who produces a ton of stuff may not say, oh, I'm creative, but they're, crea they're creators. Um, so I think, in my opinion, it's better to be a creator than it is to be a creative. Like, you know, whether, <clears throat> because the thing is, creator itself is so expansive. Yeah, it, you could literally create anything you want to, especially nowadays. Well, and we're going to talk a lot more about the the ability to create things uh, specifically through artificial intelligence. I know that's going to be a big part of today's conversation. Um, but what I would love to get a little bit more uh, background about first, because I'm a big believer and I would assume that you have probably experienced something similar, having interviewed literally, I think, about seven or eight times more people than I have. And I feel pretty good about my 300 plus interviews. And all of a sudden, I'm very insecure about it. I've only interviewed 300 people talking to you. Um, but I think that it's really important for people to understand the messenger before they learn about the message. And I think yeah. the messenger in your journey is so important. So the fact that you call yourself the unmistakable creative and you talk to all these creative people, I want to talk a little bit more about how that journey happened because you originally came from having a business degree at Berkeley and an MBA from Pepperdine. So you're the last person that somebody would look at on paper and say, oh, clearly he is a creative. So how did this yeah. transition happen? Entirely by accident. Um, so you, you know better than anybody, as somebody who works in the entertainment industry, how this story will play out. Like this won't sound surprising to you. So I uh, I was working. I think you know at finished Berkeley. I you know had had a bunch of jobs that I wasn't very good at. Um, mainly because in those days, like this concept of like passion, purpose, you know, self-actualization, none of that was really there. And even if I'd heard it at that age, it would have been like this all sounds like a bunch of new age horseshit. Um, 
but you know, I got into a point where I was like, I need something to change. And you know, Indian parents, like the standard path is, you know, um, the joke is doctor, lawyer, engineer, failure. Um, but <laughs> basically like, you know, it, it was just the next logical step was like, okay, I got to go to graduate school. I got rejected everywhere that I applied to business school. Um, I knew, and part of it was a combination of things. Like I always had had this love for movies, much like yourself and TV. And I was just getting really absorbed in all the TV that I was watching. Like I remember, you know, watching the OC, like just religiously, which, you know, the pop culture taste of a teenage girl. Um, and for some reason, I just love all this teeny bopper stuff. But like, I watched it religiously. Then I watched Entourage. And like, in my mind, I thought, you know what? I'm like, I know what I want to do. I want to create entertainment. Like that is the the dream. Like I, I really, I just like, I was like, yeah, I've always been captivated by this. And so that's what I want to do. And then, you know, I got rejected from business school at NYU Stern because I applied to NYU, Columbia, USC, and uh, UT Austin, all because I thought they would give me a foothold in, into entertainment just because USC and, and NYU had the film schools, Columbia also. And then I got to LA. So I chose to go to Pepperdine because I didn't get in anywhere else. And I was like, well, if I want to work in the entertainment industry, the LA is the place to be. And about two and a half weeks in, I got a rude awakening and I realized nobody hires MBAs to do creative work in the entertainment industry. You get to bait. I was like, well, I don't want to sit around and be the person at Disney who basically analyzes spreadsheets to figure out how well movies are selling. I want to be the person making the movies. And so once I came to that realization, it just kind of was an afterthought. And not only that, I was like, I'm 30 something. I can't go and work in the mailroom at William Morris for $10 an hour. That just, that path is not realistic at this point in my life. Um, so I ended up getting a job at Intuit the summer between my first and second year of business school as the social media intern. And you know, to, to, you know, just like make a long story short, me and jobs are a match made in hell. I think it was you who told me, right? You're great at working with people, but terrible at working for them. That was um, me. See, that's what my memory is like. This is why, you know, like we'll talk about that in a second because you're talking about aggregating all of this. So um, I was the same way, but I never realized it. And so I'd been fired from every job I had ever had. I, I didn't get a job offer at the end of the internship. And my boss actually said, he's like, I'll tell you what, you know, he said, you don't believe me, but right now, uh, you know, you will realize I'm doing a huge favor by not hiring you. Funny enough, he had worked in the entertainment industry. He had been an agent, <laughs> uh, but he was, you know, uh, on the marketing team at Intuit. And I was just like, well, what I, I was like, I don't enjoy paying taxes. You know, I don't enjoy paying taxes. Like, why the hell would I want to work on them for a living? Um, but it was the early exposure to all things social media. Um, and so, you know, then I went to spend a semester in Brazil uh, in 2008. I came back and it was 2009. So the job market had fallen apart. Uh, and so I'd started this website literally called 100 reasons you should hire me and thinking, you know, and I copied what I saw from somebody else. Like this girl, Jamie Verone had had this website called Twitter should hire me. And I was like, wow. And she was like amazing. And she got all this media attention. So I thought, well, that's clever. I need to find a way to stand out. And I couldn't come up with a hundred reasons why anybody should hire me. So it was just, I mean, but more importantly, what I realized was the idea was flawed from the, the first place because one, the fact that I couldn't come up with a hundred reasons after getting an MBA and an undergraduate degree already was like hugely problematic. I was like, wow, I don't have any tangible evidence of the things that I say I know how to do. And so, you know, that started two things. Um, one, because I had run out of money, I moved home to my parents' house. My dad lent me $500 to sign up for an online course about how to build a blog. And I started surfing. Uh, because surfing is a fantastic hobby for unemployed people because it takes a ton of time and it doesn't cost money. Um, so I surfed for six hours a day and I wrote every day for probably eight or nine months straight. And the only reason I started any of this was to try to help me find a job. And I did, uh, eventually running social media for an online travel company. And eventually I got like go from that job and, you know, it, so basically the whole thing took on a life of its own that I just couldn't have planned or predicted. Uh, and by about 2013, I was kind of like, I've been at this for four years. Like one, there's not a, I've interviewed all these people, no publishers coming to knock on my door to hell with it. I'm going to self-publish. Um, and that self-published book, the one you quoted from became a Wall Street Journal bestseller. And yeah, from there, it was kind of a totally different ball game because you know, we didn't start out as the unmistakable creative. Like it was just a podcast for bloggers and it didn't start out in any big way or with any grand vision. It literally was, I plugged a microphone. I didn't even plug a microphone. I didn't even use a, a regular microphone for 200 episodes. I literally used a built-in microphone on my laptop 
But the first, the way it started was I had this idea. I uploaded an MP3 to my blog. And after 13 interviews, one guy who uh, was one of my guests, I emailed him and I said, Hey, I want to start a multi author blog. You know, would you be a contributor? And he was like, That's a terrible idea. You're not even that good of a writer, but your interviews are something. And you know, to this day, we joke. And I, I have always said, I'm an average writer at best. The only reason I write anything worth reading is because I write a lot. Uh, but he said that I had some of the interviews and he was like, I think you should, you know, spin it out into a separate site. And if you scroll through my Instagram feed, you can see the exact email he sent me. Um, it was quoted in, in the book that I wrote. One hour later, with my limited design skills, I mocked up a version of a website called Blogcast FM. I emailed him back and said, is this what you had in mind? When do you want to start? I don't think that's what he had in mind. <laughs> uh, so he ended up being my first business partner. And then, you know, from there, he kind of took on a life of its own. And, you know, we became the unmistakable creative in 2014. And so now we're going on 14 years, I think. Wow. Um, so that, that's, the, that's the condensed version of what, you know, that's the shortest way I can tell that story. Sure. And the, the, there's a couple of things that I want to pull out of this in an area that I want to dig deeper. But the one that I think is so important and the reason that I wanted to start with that passage is that you had so much pressure, either culturally or from society. Here is the path. You are supposed to go down this path. And I've never heard it the way that you said it. I'm um, I'm, uh, pretty familiar with the whole idea of Indian culture. And like you said, doctor, lawyer, engineer. I'd never heard failure added on it. That was hilarious. I heard that from a podcast guest. (laughs) Yeah. So I, I, I loved that description. But you realized at a certain point that I would rather leave all of that, be unemployed, forge my own path, because I know that moment is coming, that moment of reckoning where I ask myself, am I at peace with how I spent my time in my life, right? That's a a big fundamental question that I ask all the time. And you just just decided, I'm going to face the fear, I'm going to dive in head first, and I'm going to do something really authentic being myself. But Mm. that also comes at a cost. So I know that there was a period where all this media attention, Wall Street bestseller, you've got this podcast going, and then all of a sudden, crickets. Talk to me about going from the best year of your life to what is conceivably one of the worst years of your life. Not conceivably the worst year of my life. Not, (laughs) it was the worst year of my life. Um, all right. So here's a couple of things. I want to comment on what you said, you know, like this whole idea of the set path. So one thing I realized, you know, when I got to uh, graduating from business school, I was like, wait a minute, I have done this for 10 years, the way other people have told me to do this. And look where I'm at. I'm broke. I'm 30 years old and I'm living at home. If I make the same decisions for the next 10 years that I did in the previous 10, where am I going to end up? And I'm like, yeah, you know, people are, you're choosing uncertainty. I was like, well, I know how that path ends. It basically ends with me getting fired. It's kind of like that scene in the matrix where Trinity is basically in the cab and she tells Neo where he's about to get out of the cab. She was like, you know where that road ends. And I was like, yeah, that's kind of what I felt. I was like, I know where that road ends. So I'm going to gamble on the uncertainty of this and see where it takes me. So yeah, four years, you know, busting my ass. 2013, like a rocket ride to the moon, you know, Wall Street Journal bestseller, sold out event, rebrand. And then everything goes to shit. Largely through my own doing, by the way, which is is something that I, I did not want to take responsibility for. Yeah, you know, I think that there's this difference we need to to establish here between blame and responsibility. Like when things go bad, we tend to blame ourselves, but we don't take responsibility. And you know, it was a combination of several factors all at once. Like you know, I had a relationship that didn't work out. I had um, you know some financial problems. It was the funny thing is that like I'm describing it to you now, and like it was nowhere as near as bad as it felt at the time. It was like all consuming at the time. It was just really. I, I was not um, emotionally mature, I would say, for being somebody who was my age. I didn't, I hadn't gone through what I needed to, you know, to, to really understand. There are numerous things that, that came out during that process. One is I, I realized the, the reality of being a public figure in any way at all means that your life is not private anymore and that the way that you behave both publicly and privately have huge implications. I mean, like, you know this better than anybody, man. You produce TV for a living. You work with celebrities. Like, not that I'm anywhere as near as famous as somebody like Ralph Macchio, but the reality is that the moment you're in the public eye, and I've been on reality TV as well, I did not deal well with that situation. And as a result, I made it worse um, to the point where we went from this sold-out conference, you know, in 2013, sold in two weeks, to literally feeling like, 
that things were just going to blow up in our face. We pulled the plug on the conference the next year uh, in 2015, you know, and it was, it was a low point to the point where I, I told my parents, I'm like, you know what? If I, you know, the only reason I said this was to give them some peace of mind. Like my business partner at the time was like, your parents just need to know that you're not going to chase some pipe dream. He's like, of course, that's a lie, but you just need to tell them that, to give them some, so that way they'll leave you alone for a year. So I was like, give it to the end of the year. If, it, if I don't have it to get, if things don't get better by the end of the year, I'll go find a job. And two months later, I got the book deal. Um, but largely what it was, was a lesson in the importance of knowing how to regulate your emotions, um, particularly when you are in a situation in the public eye. Like, you know, I remember like, you know, fast forward a couple of years later, like, you know, I'd been on Indian matchmaking and, you know, I was basically paired with somebody who was the villain of the show. Her mom called me a loser. And the truth is like, I learned from my first experience of being an idiot that there was the best thing I could do in this moment was to have composure about it and to just deal with it with grace. And as a result, you know, the press was very kind to me. I didn't fight back on anything. Anytime I was interviewed, I was very mindful and I still am to, to be clear that, look, I'll talk to you about my experience of the show, but I will not say anything about another person based on this experience. We'll have a general commentary because like, what good is that going to do? to go and bash them, even if they're bashing me. Again, this is what happens when you're in the public eye, because when you are in the public eye, everything you say and do is scrutinized and it's amplified. The same thing that I say in private to a group of friends, whatever, like it doesn't matter. If I do that on a media platform like Netflix, it can get con misconstrued. It can get, you know, like spun out. And so that was one big thing. And, and I also realized I'm like, I don't have the luxury anymore of allowing my personal life to affect my ability to run my business, especially when you have things like investors and your know, agents. At this point, everything I do in the public eye is a reflection on every single person who has ever been on. It's a reflection on you, Zach, if I go out and act like a jackass because you're one of my podcast guests. So that's, I think, the big lesson in all of that is that it's this interesting balancing act. Like I had this conversation with Tim John on his podcast about the idea of a hundred, you know, authenticity. And I said, authenticity is so misunderstood. Nobody wants us to be a hundred percent authentic if we're in the public eye, because they don't give a damn about our problems. They want us to solve theirs. Like nobody comes to you, Zach, and says, Zach, tell me about all your problems, write about them, blog about them. They're like, no, Zach, write a blog post that solves my problems. I don't care about your problems. As far as I'm concerned, you don't have any. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the, the other thing about this, too, that I think is so important with this idea of authenticity, and I'm sure that you've seen this all over the Internet, especially over the last couple of years, where right now authenticity is a strategy, right? The mm -hmm. in thing right now is being authentic. I'm like, that is an absolutely paradoxical statement, right? <laughs> is it, yeah. uh, authenticity, it either is or it isn't. And you're right. You do have to be careful with the level of authenticity that you convey. And this applies to anybody that's in the public eye. I don't really think of myself in the public eye, but every once in a while I'm reminded that I am like I went to a uh, an industry party over the weekend and I was just thinking, oh, I'll just sneak in and say hi to a few friends that I worked with a few years ago and watch the screening. And all of a sudden, a bunch of people are coming up to me saying, oh, I, I love your newsletter and you helped me get this job. And I was like, oh, shit, that's right. People actually know who I am. I keep forgetting that. So I have to be careful about if I'm going to grab a second plate of dessert. Oh, wait, what do you mean? Zach eats sugar? Oh, my God. I thought he was Mr. Nutritious, Mr. American Ninja Warrior and you have to think about all this stuff. But at the end of the day, I'm just going to authentically and unapologetically do these things. But the idea of authenticity being a strategy or a tactic, I just, I could go on for hours about how well, much this frustrates me. Yeah, well, I, I think one, that's that's actually, so I, I wrote about this somewhere. I have no idea where the note was. I was like, it was about authenticity as a marketing strategy or you know, strategy of any kind is incredibly manipulative to your audience. You know, like if you don't realize that, it's like you'll see these people, right, who will post things on Facebook. I remember some woman who had like literally hours before she posted this, walked in on, you know, either her boyfriend or somebody else cheating on her. And then she wrote about it on Facebook. And I'm like, and of course she gets this outpouring of like empathy, sympathy from everybody. But it's like, you realize this is not really appropriate for public consumption. Like this is one of those things. Danielle Laporte put it best when it came to difficult experience. She's like, I never write about challenging experience until I'm done processing it. And because at that point, it goes from being seeking pity from your audience to being something that's of service to them. 
Which again, goes back to your point of, I don't care about your problem, solve mine. And what I have found about being, about building an audience over the years is that the authenticity is important, but the people that are really going to follow you are the ones that say, Hey, those problems that you had, that you have perspective on that you have solved. That's the problem that I have now. And that yeah. to me is the key to building an authentic and an engaged following as opposed to, well, they say that this year's strategy in 2023 is authenticity. So I'm going to make sure that that's my strategy. Like you're going to just surround yourself with people that have no alignment with who you are and what you do. Uh, and I think that the, the way that this applies specifically to those that are listening and watching today is not so much from the public eye. I don't have a bunch of like big name A-list podcasters that are listening, but authenticity in my mind is such a core strategy if you do creative work. Especially, and this is going to help us segue into the idea of AI, so much creative work can now be generated in mass at scale in minutes. But what I have said before, and I, I know that there's there are several sides to this AI conversation, one of which is the existential crisis of, oh my God, Skynet has become aware and all of the humans are going to be replaced and it's going to do all of the work. And then there's the other flip side, and I think you're closer to this one, which is this is an incredibly powerful tool if you learn how to use it and harness it and organize information and it can help you be more productive. I'm kind of sort of in the middle right now. I don't have nearly yeah. the amount of experience or knowledge that you do with it, but my feeling is that what is so important to maintain and thrive a career as a creative is that you must be authentic, you must be unique, you need a perspective, and your work has to have soul. You do that, yeah. you're going to be protected from artificial intelligence until the end of time. If your work is yeah. basically mediocre and you just aggregate other people's information or voices or content, you're screwed. That's kind of where yeah. I stand, so I'm curious what you think of that. Okay. So this is, this is really interesting one, because I've spent, you know, 13 years aggregating other people's ideas, but I've also made them my own written about them. Um, so let, let's, we kind of have to give people a history lesson in order to get to the, the point of this conversation. So let's start, you know, in the mid nineties, when I was at Berkeley, you know, we basically, we were in this age of the infancy of the internet where, Things like building a website, you know, uh, took, you know, hundreds of hours, thousands of dollars and technical aptitude. There's this thing that what I call the creativity technology gap, which is the gap between, you know, uh, the necessary skills that you have in, and, you know, like to, to bring an idea to life, right? The gap between, you know, an idea and your ability to bring it to life is, is what it is. And so what happens is... Every time when you have innovations, those innovations narrow that gap, right? And you have the intersections of multiple technologies. And this is something that I learned from Julian Smith, um, speaking of aggregating things that you learn from podcasts. Yeah. So one thing Julian had all said to me when we first spoke was that technology is like a series of Jenga blocks. And the thing is, each Jenga block makes something possible that wasn't possible before. And, you know, and, and if, if there's anything that anybody should listen to in this entire interview, it's this right here. Um, because this literally has been the foundation of billions of dollars in innovation. Like almost every product you use today was conceived because of this very theory. So if we go back to the early, early 90s, right? Um, you know, just as the start of the internet was happening, right? Mark Andreessen was a young grad student. He creates this thing called Mosaic, um, which then becomes Netscape. And the only reason I know Mosaic is because my dad caught me looking at porn at the university because people at you know, universities had high speed internet and they had access to this. And, you know, nobody at that time, you know, we didn't have the, the like ability to hide our browsing history. So, you know, my dad gets to see pictures of Pamela Anderson in his office and he's just like, you're looking at pictures of Pamela Anderson. So Zach, what was the very first thing you ever searched for on the internet? Because I've asked guys my, in our age group and I, any one of them who says it isn't porn, I think is full of shit. Um, so I don't have an actual first memory. I don't legitimately know what it is, but the first memory that stuck because my mom has told this story countless times is that as soon as she got the internet, and when we say high speed, it was like dial up and like 28K, yeah. right? Um, but she said that the week after we got the internet, and by the way, she tells this story at every party and everybody she talks to. She's like, you know, the first week I got the internet, our printer ran out of ink very, very quickly. Right. Because I was going and I was, it, I mean, it's like, oh my God, it's a, it's like having, you know, the porn is a magazine, but it's on the yeah. internet and you can get whatever you want. But essentially you click on a button, you walk away to make a sandwich. Five minutes later, it's halfway loaded. Like the kids and nowadays, you're, you're, I'm you're sounding so old, but they don't know what it's yeah. like to see. Eh. 
scanning down, scanning <laughs> down. You're like, almost there, almost there, almost there. So when it would scan, so I wouldn't have to reload it, I would print it. My mom yeah. was always like, why is there never any colored ink in our printer anymore? So that's yeah. the short version right. of answering your question. Yes. So the, the, and believe it or not, we will tie this to, to something very relevant. So, you know, believe it or not, the, the adult film industry has like a huge, you know, like role to play in how we use the internet today. If you haven't seen it, the movie Middlemen with Luke Wilson is fantastic. It's funny. So basically what happens is these two guys who basically understand that you can process a credit card over the internet, that comes from the adult film industry. So they figure that out. Mark Andreessen creates the commercial web browser. You merge those two technologies and e-commerce as you know it is born. That's how you get Amazon. That's how you get eBay. That's how you get every damn online shopping site we've ever had, right? Fast forward a couple of years to like early 2008. Um, the iPhone comes out, right? And when you have the iPhone, what you get is the intersection of a couple of things, mobile devices, location tracking, and the ability to open electronic locks is one thing. That's what led Julian to create Breather, which is like Airbnb for office space. But you think about just the intersection of a mobile device and location tracking, what does that facilitate? Uber, you know, uh, DoorDash, all these other things, right? All these things that wouldn't have been possible before you had GPS and the iPhone. So now we get to, you know, where we're at now, right? Which is all these Jenga blocks that suddenly make hundreds and hundreds of things possible that weren't possible before. Versus when we started in the early 90s, right? That creativity technology gap that I spoke about was really wide. Like if you didn't have the skills to bring an idea to life, you were screwed. Like I remember, I was telling a friend, I had an idea that kind of sounded similar to YouTube. Like when I was walking campus, like oh, okay, we should put TV on the internet. Of course, like that's happened. But at that time, like I had no idea that, you know, how to do that. I wasn't a computer science major. But if you look at just go, to, let's take something as simple as building a website. If you look at the contrast between in the ni- mid nineties, early nineties to now, what then took, Dozens of hours, maybe hundreds of hours and thousands of dollars can all be done for less than $10 and under an hour for some, with somebody who has zero technical knowledge. And that's been possible for a while. That's nothing new. Okay. Uh, so with all that framed in mind, there's one other piece of this that we have to establish. And the reason I'm thinking about this in this way is because I'm working on a book called The Artificially Intelligent Creative that was just a, a fortunate accident, but a really good example of this whole concept that worked. So if you go back to the Industrial Revolution, you know, Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, which is like sort of a foundational economic textbook, said division of labor is the key to maximizing output, which obviously that makes sense. You work in the film industry, right? Like you're the editor, somebody does the acting, somebody else does the script writing. So obviously division of labor is great because of the fact that it allows each person to do what they're great at. And it's also what allowed Henry Ford to build the assembly line and manufacture cars at scale. And it's effectively been the foundation of growth in almost any business for hundreds of years. The only problem is that the division of labor is incredibly cost prohibitive to the overwhelming majority of people, unless you have deep pockets or somebody's given you tens of thousands of dollars it's not viable. Like labor is expensive. Labor is expensive because you have to pay salaries. Labor is expensive because you have to deal with people. And so that ability to do things at scale has always been limited to a handful of people who are powerful, who have money, who have deep pockets. And what AI is, is the greatest equalizer in a hundred years. Because since the industrial revolution, we've never seen something like this, where you're taking the power of scalability and putting it into the hands of everyone. Now, let's go back to the beginning of what you said about this, right? What this does is is give you that scalability, but the thing that is so vitally important here to realize is that 50% of this equation is human. And That's where there are very uniquely human skills that AI cannot match you with. And those skills really matter a lot because it's no longer your ability to, you know, know how to use a tool, but rather imagine what's possible with that tool. 
right? So the thing is, like, I remember when Dolly first came out, of course, I was like, just stupid image generators. Like, let me try dumb, dumb shit that, you know, it was like, give me a picture of Joe Biden kicking Vladimir Putin in the balls. It was like, sorry, that's against our content policy. Um, but, you know, I, I did what any person does with technology. You do something stupid just to, to see what it can do. Now, I was showing you some of the things that I've been doing over the last couple of weeks. OK, and I'll show you a, a really good example of this, like uh, in this video. So uh, in, in this interview. So you know, when you have that ability to scale, what we need to think about one is, OK, if, if 50 percent of the equation is human, that means your imagination, your creativity and your ability to communicate clearly matters a hell of a lot. Right. Because it's that whole computer science metaphor, garbage in, garbage out. So. You know, I after Kevin Roos had that crazy experience with Microsoft's uh, ChatGPT search engine, I decided I was like, let me push ChatGPT a little harder to see if I can get it to have a very you know bizarre conversation. I couldn't quite get it there, but I, I, I was like, what like what stupid things do humans do when they talk to you? And it wouldn't like say that humans are stupid, but eventually I got it to have a conversation with me about how to communicate with it. And I was like, okay, like, I was like, give me a simple acronym to communicate with Chad JPT. And then I was like, okay, you know what? Explain this acronym as if you were explaining it to me in first person. And I was like, you know what? I like this acronym. I was like, give it to me as something that's really funny. And so it came up with the acronym FART, as ridiculous as that sounds, right? Um, and so after we got to the acronym FART, you know, it was basically fun questions. So it's an ask fun and creative questions to make the conversation more interesting and enjoyable. Acknowledge and respond chat to chat GPT's answers to keep the conversation going. Respectful language, use respectful and appropriate language when communicating with a chat GPT to maintain a positive and productive conversation. Remember to thank chat GPT for its responses, even though it's an artificial intelligence model. No, the, the funny thing is what it's asking you to do is talk to it like you talk to a communicate with a human. So you know, like, it's like you have the smartest person in the world who's basically got a Harvard MBA, started 200 businesses, and can basically do something that any human could do, like, but a thousand times faster at your disposal. But it all depends on your ability to communicate. But even better is, I was like, you know what, rewrite this first person thing and do it in the voice of Samuel, as if it were Samuel L. Jackson, talking to me about how to use chat GPT. And I'll, here, I'll, I'll screen share this with you really quick because it's so damn funny. I like I literally like died laughing when I saw this because it was so ridiculous. Um, like the fact that it could one make that acronym fart and then basically make it sound like Samuel L. Jackson to explain this. It's incredibly advanced in what you could do. But think about the prompts that got it here. That's the more important thing, right? That we were talking about in this conversation is that all of this depends again on you as a human having the ability to clearly communicate interesting things look it's the reason i thought of things like that is because like i have a thousand interviews to draw from i have all these data points in my head so i was telling a friend i was like basically what we can say is you know ai is not going to make people who are idiots geniuses it's going to make smart people a lot smarter um you know so i think what we have to go back to is like okay what are the uniquely human skills and then the other thing and, and this is fresh on my mind because i was working on this Last night, and again, a lot of this has evolved through just you know throwing things into Chat GPT to start looking at AI not as a tool but as a partner. And how would you treat a partner? So imagine the scenario is that you basically are hiring somebody, but instead of hiring a person, you're going to basically create a version of that person using AI. And I literally asked Chat GPT, I'm like, these are all the tasks in my business. Convert this into an artificially intelligent team and minimize the need for human involvement and give me five different scenarios in which this is possible. And you think about the amount of time it would take a human to do that kind of processing, to put together scenarios. In 30 seconds, it gave me five different scenarios and manipulated them. And I said, great, give me the tools and the tasks and everything else to basically make these scenarios a reality. But then I showed you just now the artificially intelligent search engine for unmistakable that, you know, I conceived of in a drunken haze, you know, while it was literally an hour of conversation with Chad GPT. I was like, okay, great. How do I do this? I was like, give me the landing page copy. Give me this. I'm like, okay, recommend layout and design. Again, it's speeding up a lot of things, but what everything comes back to, and this is the thing that I, I can't emphasize enough, 
is that all AI depends on human input. That's it. Like if you understand that, that changes everything. Then you start to think about where can I leverage, not replace my creative, like leverage AI, but not replace you. You know, I, I think that that is another thing we have to understand. It's like, okay. And so I'm a podcast host. I write, like, I want illustrations for my blog post. You know what? I'm not going to, I, like, I don't outsource my writing to AI because I know that's something I want to still have my quality. Luckily, the way that my uh, second brand in Mem is set up is all of my notes are written in my own words. So even when I do use its AI to write, it basically uses something called content aware AI. So it sounds like something that I wrote. It very rarely sounds like something I didn't. And that's the thing. That's one other foundation of this is data, right? So for a long time, basically what has been happening is big companies have been doing this for a very long, long time. Google, Facebook, the reason they all know so much about you is because they have so much data on you. So as somebody who has a thousand podcast episodes and transcripts of those episodes, you can imagine, you know, add that plus, you know, a thousand book notes plus a thousand ideas for blog posts, you know, all written in my own words. Having access to that volume of data is basically one of the biggest you know, superpowers that I have because like, you know, that, that, you know, UC bot thing I showed you, there's no way that's going to work as well. Like that would work. You know, that's going to be amazing with a thousand interviews. And you saw like right now, the model had two interviews in it, you know, and you saw how accurate it was. It was like that you got an answer for something. And you also had the context for the answer. Um, so what we're talking about is the ability to do things at scale and create at the speed of thought enabled by human imagination and creativity. So really what I think is key here, and I know I've been just rambling for a while, but that's kind of the nature of this, is understanding like what is it that makes you human and what can you bring to this? Because this doesn't like negate the need for originality or original thinking. It just enables people to compensate for skills. Like I'm not a video guy or an animator guy, but um, I'm going to show you this, this thing here. So, and, and part of this is having fun with it and experimenting with it, right? So you know, when my nephew was born, being a child of the 90s, like, you know, I wanted to expose him to music. So we started with 90s hip hop, um, Boys to Men. And for some reason, anytime we played Fresh Prince of Bel Air, the kid would just laugh. He would smile. We're like, all right. So one day, out of pure boredom, and this I think is a really good way to, to uh, example of the combination of, you know, human creativity enabled by AI. So I basically was like, you know what? Uh, I was just bored. I was like, rewrite these lyrics to the Fresh Prince of Bel Air uh, about a baby that's going to daycare because my sister was going back to work and he was going to be starting daycare. And so I wrote the lyrics for this song called The Fresh Prince of Daycare. And, you know, I modified it based on a few things. And I said to my sister, she's like, this is hilarious. And so we thought, this is cute. But I was like, neither of us can rap. I got an Upwork and I hired a freelance rapper. And I was like, I need you to record this for me. Um, and he turned it around. All right. After he sent it to me, I was like, this is cool, but you know what would be even more fun if I animated this? All right, so if I'm going to animate this, I need a couple of things. I need characters, I need scenes. I literally threw the lyrics into ChatGPT, and I was like, generate all the scenes for me based on these lyrics. And then I basically said, I used Dolly, I was like, generate characters that look like 3D Pixar characters. Um, I need a baby, you know, whatever. And then I realized, okay, Adobe Character Animator, this is where my work is going to come in, like where I have to learn how to rig puppets and all this shit, you know? And I was like, okay. And I got stuck. And I was asking ChatGPT about things. Finally, I was like, this is really inefficient. I'm like, you know what? Design a 10-day curriculum for me. Apply Scott Young's principles of accelerated learning and teach, you know, create this curriculum so I can learn how to use Adobe Character Animator. And the result of all that was this, Okay. Um, and I think you'll get a kick out of this because it's pretty damn funny. <laughs> now this is a story all about how my life as a baby turned upside down. And I'd like to take a minute just to sit right there. I'll tell you how I began the principal place called daycare. San 
Santa Monica, born and raised in the playpen is where I spend most of my days. Chilling out, playing, relaxing, all cool and exploring new things and learning like I'm in school. And a couple of days past, my went to her job. Tried to keep her home, but she just wouldn't stop. She seen I tried to crawl, and my mom felt sad. She said, you're going to daycare, but baby, please don't be mad. I begged and pleaded with her day after day, but she packed my backpack and sent me on my way. She gave me a kiss, and then she gave me my lunch. I put my baby bib on and said, I might as well munch. First day, yo, this is new. Being the only boy with three girls to view. Is this what the days in daycare is like? Hmm. This might be all right, but wait, I hear the giggly milk juice all that. Is this the type of place that they should send this little chap? I don't think so. I'll see when I get there. I hope they're prepared for the Prince of Daycare. I was over and when I came out, there was a teacher inside who greeted me with a smile. I ain't trying to get upset yet, I just got here. I was eager to see like a curious little deer. Was led to my class and when it got near, the toys were there and here and books everywhere. If anything, I could say this class was fun, but I thought, nah, forget it. My home is they care. the place about seven or eight and i waved to the teacher yo bye see you later i looked at my mom i was into her care i was put in her car as the prince of daycare so the thing i think that this demonstrates you know like is it is it you know the greatest quality animation no but i think it's a glimpse into what is going to be possible yeah like keep in mind that is the result of me first trying to teach myself something i didn't know how to do but if you think about the number of steps in which AI was involved in the process, right? ChatGPT did all the lyrics. A human performed the vocals. ChatGPT came up with the ideas for the scenes. ChatGPT generated a curriculum for me to teach myself how to use Adobe Character Animator. That in and of itself is remarkable. The fact that I can say, I don't know how to do this thing. I need a, a rather than say, you know, let me outsource this to AI. I was like, no, I want to learn how to do this because it still took my own imagination to do all of those things. It was my own creativity that, you know, had to be involved in doing that. So what I, I, I think is that, you know, what generative AI does is it, it basically expands what is creatively possible for people. Like there are a lot of things there that I could not have done before. And so if we, let's assume, for example, that that, you know, what, you know, I, that process could be streamlined. Like I could talk to you, Zach, right now. And keep in mind, this a year from now, this is where we will be. And, you know, I have a conversation, there's something funny, we have an idea, and we say, okay, ChatGPT, write this script, Dolly, generate the characters, you know, Adobe Character Animator here, let's rig these puppets, like, make sure they're all good to go, drop it into Character Animator, and basically, we could effectively produce a pilot episode of, like, something South Park quality in under an hour. We could synthesize the voices of the characters, we could make it funny as shit. I already know because I've had ChatGPT write a few scripts for me for silly ideas um, to see. And so that's what I think we have to realize is that, is this going to be a threat to humans? Yes and no. But at the same time, it's like, it's an enabler. So for example, like I would have not, like, think about what it would take for me to have created South Park 10 years ago versus now. Like now, if I get better at Adobe Character Animator, Designing the characters is a breeze. All I have to do is use AI. And the other thing is that baby that you see in the video, I uploaded like 50 pictures of my nephew and had the model train it and say, make it a Pixar looking character of my nephew. Like that's what is creatively possible. Like, and so I, I don't, I'm not fearful of this because what it's doing is it's giving me the ability to do things faster that I could before and do things that I couldn't do before. It takes us back to the very beginning of that Jenga block, right? What does this make possible that was not possible before? And one other question I will add to this is, as you contemplate this idea, is what can I make now that I couldn't before? Because my mentor, Greg, he traveled around the country right after the Great Recession and he would meet people and he would ask them, do you know how to use the internet? And of course, they'd all look at him like he was on a crack. Then he would say, great, show me something that you've made using the internet. 
And that right there was, you know, a big thing. Like, and for me, I, that's the way it, I, my default attitude towards technology is technology is for making things. What can you make with it? Especially as a creator. Yeah. Um, that's my first question. Every time I see something new, I'm like, what does this allow me to make that I couldn't make before? What can I do that I couldn't do before? Yeah. So, so there was, that was a very long, like, it, but there's a million and a half threads that I could pull. Uh, we could go on for hours and hours on each of these little pieces. There's two, well, maybe there's more than two, but there's at least two right now that really, really stand out for me. If we talk about this entire workflow, this entire process of whether it was you asking chat GPT to write the lyrics or having AI create the image, all these other pieces, there are even some pieces in there that I think that very, very soon you're going to be able to go to some AI bot and say, mm -hmm. create the lyrics for me. And it's going to sound just like a human being with human inflections. I mean, there are even there are products possible. that are already doing that. Right. Yeah. But here, here's the key. There, there's going to be two sides to this. I think that the, the two areas I want to go next are number one, what you didn't do was say, come up with a funny idea for a video. The, uh, the genesis of everything you talked about came from you. It came from the human mind. And something that I've talked about extensively is understanding how to define what creativity is. And I don't know if you're familiar with Joey Caffone. He wrote the book, The Laws of Creativity. He'd be a great, great guest for your show. Uh, but essentially, he talks about how creativity is not about original ideas. It's about the combination of existing ideas and unique patterns. And what you said is, I want to take the idea of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and I want to combine it with daycare. You didn't say, chat GPT, create an idea for me. And it said, I know, let's make a funny video that combines the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and makes it a parody at daycare. You came up with it. That's the first key where I think it's so important is that, again, the, the nuance or the soul or the voice of the idea came from a human place. But here is the other part that I want to dig into that's the antithesis of this. If all of, everything that we're talking about as far as a human generated the idea and used creative, uh, I, creative uh, images and creative uh, separate ideas to bring it all together into this new combination as you did, what you said that scares me and I think could scare a lot of other people is that AI isn't a tool. AI can be a creative partner. And that's where I as a creative would say, whoa, that means you're going to hire chat GPT to do a lot of the work that I'm making my living doing now. So yeah. in the, so the, the idea is that the gen and the third thing that I want to bring up, I knew there were three, I couldn't remember what it was. Um, the third one is the importance of communication. Even before the internet or before AI, your ability to generate creative ideas and have a finished product was largely predicated on your ability to communicate those ideas. <coughs> Excuse me. So especially in the world of Hollywood, you can't make things in a vacuum. If you're a painter, mm -hmm. you can be in a room all by yourself from idea to finished canvas. It's all you and it comes out of your soul. In the yep. world of TV and film and all of the media that's out there now, you can't make it in a vacuum. Your ability to communicate your ideas and collaborate is key. And now we're talking about honing this creative skill of collaborating with technology instead of humans, which I agree, yep. again, is a skill that we're all – I think there are going to be entire college curriculums that are going to teach yeah, you how to this communicate is, with AI. You literally – I realized like the, that I had left that – You know, I realized after talking to a couple of friends, I was like, you know, while I'm writing this book, I was like, I need to chat – I need a chapter on how to do this. And that's how I got into that conversation with ChatGPT, which led to the FART acronym, which I thought was really hilarious. Um, so to your point, right, like one of the things we have to, to still realize is that these are all language models. They're all machines. They're going to generate output that's amazing, you know, sounds amazing. But there are a couple things. One is that ChatGPT or any AI, AI doesn't have preferences. It doesn't have opinions. It doesn't have emotions, right? It can't so, be bargained with. It can't be reasoned with. It doesn't feel well, pity or remorse. Sorry, are, I just had to quote the Terminator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, okay. You yourself said to me in our interview, what you do is you paint with emotion, right? As an editor. That is not something that a machine can do. Maybe it can pick up syntax, but not in the way that you can. You know why? Because a machine doesn't feel emotions. You do. Right. Like you and I talked about that, you know, the playing with the voice scene in, in Cobra Kai. Like the the thing is that there is something about that that is uniquely human. Like when I hear you know, my sound engineer put something together in a way that just makes me go, yeah, like I feel it. I can't outsource that 
to a machine. And at the end of the day, you're going to come up with things that are, like I said, I think that we need to see it as a partner, not as something to replace us. And it's a partner that is smart, that works faster than 90% of humans. What it's, it, like I said, I mean, to me, it's the enabler that basically takes power that was solely in the hands of a handful of large companies and you know, powerful people like the entertainment industry, and it gives that to everybody. So, I mean, should you be, wor- as an individual, should you be worried? No. As an industry, should Hollywood be worried? Yes. Because, you know, um, I, I think it was Imad Mustak, like, uh, on a conversation with P- Peter Diamandis. He was like, this is going to lead to the disintermediation of Hollywood. Because, so let's, you know, for example, I, I literally went through this scenario the other night with Chad GBT because I was like, okay, I had this idea for a comedic sitcom based on some of the goofy stories that my friends and I had shared over the years. And I'd always wanted to write this. And I was like, okay, if I want to produce this, one, I have to get actors. I have to get somebody who actually, you know, is willing to read my script. I have to get all these, you know, things in play, um, you know, and I have to get somebody in Hollywood to give me a chance as a nobody. Like the chances of that happening are slim to none, right? I'm like, all right, let's go back to Trey Parker and Matt Stone. How the hell did they get known? They uploaded South Park, the internet, right? Now, in that moment, my light bulb was, well, what if I didn't use humans to do all the acting? What if I animated it? And I was like, well, that solves one huge problem, like animation, done. Next thing I thought was like, what about the character voices? How am I going to do this? So I got a chat GPT. I was like, is it possible to synthesize different voices from my characters? And it's like, yeah, you can do that with something called Amazon Polly. But what I, I, I think what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that you notice if, if you look at the way that I'm using chat GPT, it's not to do work for me. It's so that it can teach me how to execute things that I want to execute at a much faster speed. Like, I don't have to do any of the research. I was like, oh, okay, this is how I would do it. I'm like, synthesize the characters using Dolly. Give me the script. I mean, you know, I, I had this story of my, my cousins and how they met. Like, we're going to uh, launch a pilot episode of this podcast called How They Met Each Other, um, which is about how couples have met. And I had the, the story of my, my cousins and how they met. And so I actually went into ChatGPT. I was like, here's the transcript. Rearrange this in a way that makes for a beautiful narrative. Now rearrange it so that I can have it as a script for an animated short about these two people. I still had to come up with, like, that's, I still had to be the one to extract the stories from them in order to get that. So again, what we're talking about is human input largely determining your ability to do things. Um, and one of the and things that, that you're... One of the things yeah. that you're talking about, and I don't even know if it's still around now or if it's going to be around by the time people hear this, um, but shortly after the emergence of chat GPT, there is this AI generated version of Seinfeld. I'm sure that this yeah. is something you heard about and watched, and it was almost unwatchable, not quite, but it was really fascinating to see how it was consistently learning from itself and it was mm-hmm. getting better. It was all animated. It basically looked like a um, you know, an MTV video from the '90s, as far as the quality of the animation, but it Which was is writing pretty damn good for a machine. But the fact that it could generate itself 24 seven and had this ongoing story, that to me was both, you know, cool and kitschy, but it was also kind of terrifying because when you think about Moore's law and for anybody that's not familiar with Moore's law, it's the idea, and I'll probably get this wrong because I'm not a technologist, but essentially um, technology doubles itself in speed every couple of years, I believe, something along those lines. So if you look at like from the advent of the first hard drive of two megabytes or four megabytes and how many years it took to double that in size. Now, I mean, we can basically hold multiple terabytes on a thumb drive, which for Mm -hmm. anybody that was around just 20 years ago, I remember spending a thousand dollars on an external drive that held like 80 gigabytes. And that was a big deal, right? I'm very much aging myself. But with the speed this is moving now, you could watch your animated uh, piece. You could watch the Seinfeld thing if it's still around and hasn't been pulled by the time uh, that uh, people are listening to this. And you think, oh, this is fun. But with the speed technology is moving, it seems conceivable to me that we could have watchable entertainment that's generating itself in a matter of years. So then it, it which again brings up this idea of. Uh, yes, we're going to be able to use AI to become, I'm going to say this in huge air quotes, more productive. There's a huge downside to that. Um, That's another conversation. But there's going to come a time where if this does work and it goes to scale, all the people that were writing, all the people that were animating, all the people that were doing voices, 
if AI slowly starts to replace those people, it's no longer AI as a tool or a resource. It is now replacing the work that humans are doing. Is it not? Am yeah. I coming at this from the wrong angle? You know, I, like the the thing that, you know, I, I, I believe it or not, I've had these conversations with ChatGPT to, you know, ask it. It's like, okay, what are the things that humans are going to do, you know, uh, and what is AI good at, right? So one thing we have to realize first is that, you know, like I said, AI is in a lot of ways like a digital idiot savant that can do remarkable things and is getting better. Like it's going to get better and better and it's going to be crazy within a year what it's capable of. Um, but the thing is that, you know, if you think about, let, let's go back to like, where did all these language models come from? So like, think about, you know, how do you make it sound like Samuel L. Jackson? Well, somebody had to go and become Samuel L. Jackson in order for us to feed it. So how is it getting better? By humans being humans. Humans being humans is what enables AI to be as powerful as it is. So that doesn't mean, you know, we're going to stop doing this. Like, how does it come up with, hey, make this sound like Seinfeld? Jerry Seinfeld had to create Seinfeld for that to happen. So I think that that's, that's you know, one, one way of looking at it. I, I don't think it can replace us. Like, I, I think the fear that it's going to replace us is, look, will it replace certain jobs? Yeah, there are certain places where you should be worried. Like, if you don't have a skill that is not replaceable, like, it, it, you know, in a lot of ways, it kind of brings us full circle to like this unmistakable concept. Like, what is it that makes you stand out so much that nobody can compete with it, not even a machine? You know? And that was the uh, whole like, reason I, I wanted to start there, because yeah. this idea of and going back to it not being just a strategy, but being real is the idea of being authentic in your voice, being in your work. You decided at the very beginning of your career, this is not authentically who I am. And even though the path is uncharted and it, I don't know where it's going to go and it led to so many different directions. But you know that everything you've been through, and I would guess that if you had to do it over again, you would still mm -hmm. relive the worst year of your life as opposed to the worst decades of your life, working in finance or business or whatever direction it would have gone because you were supposed to. And what I find so fascinating about AI is that if it's used correctly, it is going to augment and enhance your ability to be creative because, like you said, and this is such a key point, what it's doing is solving the problem of aggregating the massive amounts of content and information that we already have, but it needs that outside content to combine those existing ideas. And this is one of the things that I've been talking about for years is that, and this was even before chat GPT or AI, I would say to people, information is no longer a solution. People used to highly value information. You would spend hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on the Encyclopedia Britannica because that was information that not everybody had access to. With the advent of the internet and the proliferation of all these content, of all the content access to libraries and books and all this other stuff, information transitioned from being a solution to now what I believe is one of the biggest problems that we have is how do we sift through it and find what's relevant to me? And I believe for years that the value is no longer in information, it's in curation. And I think that's another area where uh, so, AI is so important. It's not creating things from scratch. It's helping mm -hmm. us curate the things that we need based on the ideas we want to put together. So I had a business partner who, this phrase had always stayed with me because I just, every time I heard it, I was like, somebody's going to make a lot of money with that basic idea. And he said, as content becomes more infinite, curation becomes much more valuable. Um, and we've seen it, right? Like, why did all of a sudden newsletters, like the hustle and, you know, Morning Brew and uh, whatever the hell is the other one with the, the, the skim, like, literally, that's an email list. And it generates millions of dollars. Why? Because they curate. Um, because there's no way that we can you know, go through the, the you know, entire internet. But I think that, it, you know, that curates external knowledge. It's your ability to curate your own internal knowledge where your power lies. Like, you know, you and I have read hundreds of books. Like, if you saw the inside of what mem, the, the note-taking app that I looks like, you know, use looks like, you'd be like, this is insane. I'm like, yeah, it's basically the equivalent of my brain uploaded the internet. Every thought I've had, every insight I've had, every transcript, every, and all of it searchable, every bit of it linkable, every bit of it basically, you know, possible to access using different AI prompts. Um, and so it's like, hey, give me a quote by Zach Arnold. I mean, you saw the little uh, demo of the AI, AI engine that I showed you. Yes, I'm, I'm very, very curious about MEM. The reason being 
that I think that uh, if when it comes to this idea of being authentic, I'll give you an example of a workflow that I have uh, with my team now using humans because I still haven't really yep. learned um, what what the possibilities are with AI. Uh, but there's no way that I can generate or write the amount of content that now goes out with my name or my face, whether it's social media, whether it's a newsletter, whether it's course content. There's only so many things I can do in a 24 hour day, especially if in order to do it authentically, I have to do it sustainably because that's my entire mm-hmm. message. I'm not Mr. Hustle Culture. You grind and you grind and you grind and you become successful. It's I want to do it sustainably knowing that I can still maintain exercise. I can sleep eight hours a night. I can help my kids with their homework. So that means I have a very limited amount of time to do things. Therefore, I built a team around me of humans. And I've got hundreds and hundreds of newsletters that I've written for 10 years. And mm-hmm. I have a member of my team that has read those newsletters, that knows my voice, that helps me write social media. But if I could take every single newsletter that I've ever written, throw it into this program mem and say, generate a newsletter in my voice that talks about these three topics and I give it a general outline, that to me is still maintaining my voice because it's not write a newsletter that sounds like Tim Ferriss and I'm going to steal his voice. It's write it in my voice. That to me is a great way to use it, but maintain authenticity takes us right back to the foundation of this idea that every, every aspect of this relies on human input. Like it all still, like at the end of the day, humans basically are the ones who feed AI to generate the content that it generates. Like humans are a 50% part of the equation of generative AI. Like my cousin told me that and I was like, you're right. I'm like, that's huge. So this ability to communicate is in, you know, Wildly important. But yeah, to your point, like the reason it would sound like you is because it all based on stuff that you've written. I think the biggest beneficiaries of AI are going to be people who have huge bodies of work. Like somebody like me, this is basically oh, basically a gold mine that is finally ready to be mined. <laughs> yeah, like that's what I'm seeing. Because you saw that little search engine I showed you. And I was mm-hmm. like, now imagine that times a thousand of the smartest people in the world. Yeah. And for anybody that uh, that's wondering, well, what was that process? Just to walk through well, very, very briefly. Little, yeah. Yeah, but uh, essentially, yeah, you can send me a link so people can see a demo of it. But this is something that I've wanted to do for years, which is somebody can go to a search engine and I've got the search function on my website and they can say, you know, Cal Newport, James Clear, um, you know, show me Ralph Macchio and it'll bring up the interview and it's going to have the show notes and there's a transcript. But the difference is, tell me what Ralph Macchio said about living a balanced life. Boom. Like that to me is a game changer, which again, I I don't even have nearly the volume that you do, but in the world of podcasting, again, 300 episodes over eight years, there's a lot of nuggets of wisdom, but it's hard to find the nuggets. So for me, my biggest challenge has been curation. And what I have found is so important about curation is number one, being able to tell people, this is what is going to, based on all the things that I have in my library, if this is your challenge, here's what I suggest you listen to next or watch next and in what order. This is a huge thing that I've discovered that is now something I'm very much doubling down on. That, for Mm -hmm. example, um, you and I have a lot of similar guests in common, but in the world of productivity, time management, habit formation, if we take some of the guests that I've talked to, we have James Clear, Gretchen Rubin, Cal Newport, Greg McEwen, David Allen, right? All of them have a wealth of information. But what I've learned is that if you put the right information in front of somebody at the wrong time, it just frustrates them and they get stuck. But if you sequence and curate not only the right information, but in the right sequence, that's a game changer. And that's another area where I don't think that AI can just take over. That's an area where I feel you really need to understand the nuance of the human journey and be able to say, find these concepts from these authors or these guests or whatever it is and help me compile it into an outline as opposed to take all this stuff and tell me what order to to teach it in. Uh, To me, that's the level of nuance where you say it's 50% human. That's the part where I feel that I have a lot of expertise. Then I just bring in the experts and I can combine these two. So I see a lot of value in using chat GPT as a teacher, as an instructor, as a podcaster. So you have certainly convinced me that I need to spend an exorbitant amount of time digging into this to create more... more efficiencies in the business for sure. Fortunately, unfortunately, you don't have to spend an insane amount of time, but uh, just, you know, for real. So I've literally uh, in the process, uh, and I think this will be a nice place to kind of bring us full circle. Um, you know, I was just having a conversation on a whim with my, my brother-in-law 
Uh, and I was like, oh, I was like, I should make a course about artificial intelligence for creatives. And, you know, I just literally wrote a note down in memos, like artificially intelligent creative. I was like, generate an outline for a course. And it did. And I was like, cool. I'm like, I'll come back to this. You know, and the nature of MEM is that um, it uses contextual uh, AI. So like it, things will just surface randomly that you hadn't thought about for a while. Um, and, you know, I saw the note for the artificially intelligent creative. I was like, write a table of contents and a synopsis for this book. And I was like, okay. I'm like, let me actually start working on this. And so I started going in and I am, keep in mind, it's all, that synopsis was based entirely on the information that I put in, all the book notes I've taken on AI, all of which were written in my own words, not just quotes, um, put it together. And like, I think by day nine, I was like, I just wrote like nine chapters of a book in nine days. I'm like, what the hell? Um, and so then, you know, I, I put up the landing page and I was like, all right, you know what? I'm going to publish this. I'm not going to wait for a publisher because the, the idea of waiting for a publisher, I'd emailed my agent and she was like, I don't, she said, I, I, my biggest fear is that the speed things are changing. This won't be timely enough if a publisher publishes this. And I was like, fair enough. That actually demonstrates why I shouldn't work with a publisher on this book. Um, so, you know, and I was initially going to give it away for free. My brother was like, you don't be an idiot. He's like, this is actually a, a, not, not just to capitalize, but I, I know what people are like. You take things you pay for way more seriously. Um, otherwise, it'd just be another thing that ends up in people's hard drive. So I started working on this concept of the artificially intelligent creative, where I go into much more depth about a lot of the things that you and I have talked about. And that just the idea, it seemed like the most natural extension to my previous book. So I was like, okay, we run the unmistakable creative, the artificially intelligent creative. Like that has a really you know, nice ring to it. And the subtitles, how anyone can make anything and with AI. And so that is where we're at. So like, um, it's, you know, there's a pre-launch list, uh, which, you know, I'll, I'll give you guys a link. I think it's, if I remember correctly, maximize your output slash AI creative. Um, we'll make but, sure uh, I'll, I'll, whatever you send me, we'll make sure to put it in the show notes. So people know that, um, if they're interested in this, of which I think my audience very much would be, um, just go yeah. to the show notes for this episode and, uh, you will find the link there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's, you know, the fact that I could, you know, write a book like the bulk of it 80 percent of it in nine to ten days you know and really just have it sort of iterate like iteratively work on this and it's very like short spurts with small notes and like put them all back together ai makes that possible right like imagine trying to do this in a google doc or with fifty thousand note cards like these are literally tens of thousands of notes that i've compiled over the past few years and i'm like perfect like now i have it this was just a random thought that occurred to me one morning that nine days later became a book with a landing page ready to go and everything else like that's what i mean by creativity at the speed of thought like that right there the ability to create at scale and create at the speed of thought that is what we are going in at the era we're going into and if you don't understand this you're going to be at a massive disadvantage because people are going to be so much faster than you Agreed. Uh, I think that it's it's going to become one of the the most necessary skills that is not in my mind just a technical skill or a hard skill. Because for me, there's the the emphasis or the overemphasis on hard skills and creative fields just kind of drives me crazy. And I've had this conversation with writers, with directors, with editors, where essentially everything that we learn in our traditional educational system is preparing us to be ready for the job on day one. And then all of a sudden we have the job on day one and realize we're completely and totally unprepared to actually not only survive it, much less thrive it because there are so yeah. many and the the term that people use which i hate is soft skills i like the idea of human skills or life skills those to me are the much more important skills that are necessary to actually design a career that's fulfilling especially in creative fields i see this as being much more of a life skill than it is a hard skill because it, it falls under the the uh the category of communication not learn chat gpt right? Learn Adobe yeah. Illustrator, learn Adobe Premiere, learn Adobe Photoshop. The hard skill is here's where the, the paint tool is, or here's how I create lines, or here's how I insert or overwrite and edit into a timeline. But the real skill that makes you great at what you do is number one, your ability to synthesize ideas and create moments and stealing my own words from your podcast. I believe that as editors, we paint with emotions. AI can't do that. But if your job is, I need to go through and sift through all of these shots with this person's face, and I need to assemble them into a timeline in the right order, your job is going away real fast because that stuff's going to be replaced and outsourced to technology. But if you need to create something original that has nuance, that has soul, and you focus on generating the skills and improve your ability to do that, 
I believe that you're future proof against any and all artificial intelligence, at least in our lifetimes. Who knows beyond yeah. that? But that's that's where I stand right now with so much to learn. But that's at least where I stand as of recording this. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, yeah, we could talk about this for five, six hours. Like, you know, I'm I'm working on conceiving a, a class for this idea of, you know, AI for creatives. Like, uh, I, you know, part of the reason I wanted to get people on my pre-launch list for this book is so that I could ask them what they want to learn if I do a class as well, you know. Because uh, I don't want to teach the class until I've done enough of this myself that I feel like, okay, cool. Like I've basically put all these concepts to work. So the idea of like an artificially intelligent team literally is just something that I thought of today or last night. And I'm like, okay, I need to work with this idea and, and, you know, like play with it to see like, okay, what could I do and where can I basically reduce, you know, human involvement? But yeah, I mean, like I said, man, we could talk for hours about this. Well, here's the, the last thing that I want to close with, because I want to be very respectful of your time. But I would be remiss if I didn't talk about your ability to build relationships, given the literally over a thousand people that you've gotten on your podcast over the years and blend that with the conversation about AI. And I'm going to tee it up by uh, sharing a story with you that I think you're going to thoroughly enjoy. Just a couple of weeks ago, at least as of recording this podcast, I went into chat GPT and I asked it to write an outreach email to one of the highly regarded members of my field, who's Eddie Hamilton, who edited Top Gun Maverick. Everybody in my field knows Eddie Hamilton. He's held in very, very high regard. I've had him on my podcast multiple times. And one of the skills that I teach at a very high level is how to reach out to people cold so you can build a relationship with them and really design your next stages of your career path and find your next dream job. So I said, draft an outreach email to Eddie Hamilton, the editor of Maverick, to see if you can get a job. And it spit something out that was okay. And I shared it with all of my students, but I didn't tell them that it was AI. And I said, here's somebody that has generated a message, go ahead and tear down all the things that you would change and what notes would you give it. Not one person said, well, clearly this was generated by a computer. They said, you know what, this is actually pretty good, but you know, it didn't provide him enough value where it was really kind of more about them and they shouldn't have gone right you know, off the bat and said, hey, are you looking for anybody? Are you available? And I'm like, holy shit, I generated this in 15 seconds. And yep. anybody could send out this message and instantly double their ability for outreach. But again, it's missing nuance and nuance is so important in relationship building. But here's the funny part is all those questions you're asking, you could literally just keep iterating on that first prompt. That's one thing I think people don't understand. Like the first answer is never the best one. Mm -hmm. But that's the problem. We've been taught to look for quick answers. It's like, oh, this is a search result. This is the right answer. It's, it's, a, it, like I said, it, it's a partner. And a partner, like any other type of partner in your life, requires communication, you know, like real communication. And the, the funny thing is, I actually went down the rabbit hole and I kept giving it notes as if it were my student. So I gave it the exact same notes that I was giving my students when I let. So I was putting myself in the position, a student comes to me on a hot seat and they say, I had this really important email that I want to send to somebody I admire. What are your notes? So I just kept giving it notes and it couldn't get it uh, any better. It just kept going in different directions, but it could yeah. not get the nuance and the heart and the soul that goes with authentically reaching out to somebody building relationships. So I guess this would beg the question, given how many relationships you have built over the years, do you feel you could replicate what you've done over the last 10 years, getting people on your podcast, building these genuine relationships? Do you think you could outsource that to AI and get the same results? I mean, well, funny enough, like 90% of this process is already automated. Like all the emails you've ever received from me um, were not ones I wrote, they're templates because the process of booking the guest is literally the same thing over and over again. But so, automation is different from templates because you knew the process, you knew your voice and you said yeah. replicate this. I've got a whole automated system myself, now, right? the, but there's a difference yeah, between yeah. that and you send out the outreach and you get me the guess. Would you be willing to put your name on an AI generated no. outreach message to Tim Ferriss? No, not right now. Um, you know, and, and so like a couple of things about this one, I, I still to this day choose my own guests and I do all my own outreach. I've never been willing to outsource that because that's what I'm damn good at. Can I use AI to research the shit, the shit out of the person I want to you know, interview? Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, I, you know, like I know there are certain boilerplate parts of my pitch, but um, so because like the, the, I think people think that I'm way more well-known than I am. Uh, you know, like I'm the most well-connected person nobody knows. And so <laughs> I love that. You should put that on a business card. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I really should. Like, I, I know the job. I've always told people, if you want to rob a bank, run for president or become a porn star, I can introduce you to somebody who can teach you or help. Um, the, but I'll tell you, tell you what it is. Like, so, you know, you introduced me by mentioning the most famous people that I've interviewed, like, you know, some of the big names. And, and this actually, I think, speaks to how I think about the relationship building process on podcast. Those are the least interesting people that I've interviewed. You know why? Because everybody interviews them. The most interesting people that I've interviewed are the ones that nobody has ever heard. I didn't know who you were. I just thought you had an interesting story. I didn't care. Like nothing about your story made me go, oh, let me see how big this guy is. Let me see how many Twitter followers. I literally was like, this guy edits Cobra Kai. I love that show. I'm happy to talk to him. That's literally it. Like it was like that one line got me. I didn't need to read the rest of the pitch. Like that, this is where, where book publicists will send me these very complicated, you know, like long tire, you know, things. I'm like, I, you realize it's going to be one line that gets me and you cannot know what that line is because I make every choice based on curiosity. And my most important mentor, uh, this guy named Greg, he had 150 followers on Twitter. He was six weeks into a project at, called $10 on a laptop. And I just thought, this guy sounds insane. I have to talk to him. He came up with the name Unmistakable Creative. He worked, I wouldn't be where I am without him. Keep in mind, he's a guy who had 150 followers on Twitter. And I think that when it comes to relationships, like my attitude has never been to look at somebody's perceived status. At this point, like I can get high profile guests, um, you know, but I mean, I still get turned down. Like, you know, I asked you to introduce me to Ralph Macchio. That was a no go. Like, you know, his publicist, what well, he's done. Fine, whatever. I, you know, it, I, like people still turn me down. But the thing I think that was really important was that I never, my attitude had always been, do I find this thing person interesting? That's it. And yeah, sure. We've had some famous people, you know. But I've read all their books. Like the people who fascinate me are people like my friend Greg Hartle that you've never heard of, or the professional dominatrix who, you know, had one of the most poetic sound, you know, conversations I've ever had, or, um, you know, a guy who robs 30 banks. Like I'd rather talk to the guy who robs 30 banks than Tim Ferriss, you know, because you know what? That's a far more interesting story to me than, oh, how do you become more productive and like do all this crazy shit? I'm like, Great. I can read about that in Tim Ferriss' book. How did you rob 30 banks? Like, that's got the feeling of a movie. That is what I look I look for a good story and something I'm curious about. Like, that's ultimately probably why I think I've had the relations. But keep in mind, like, I may have interviewed all these people. None of them are people that I have on speed dialing. But like, yo, I, like, I can't call up Tim Ferriss and ask him for a favor. You know, like, I'm not on those kinds of terms with him. Yeah, and that's uh, that's a, something that I've seen misconstrued even at my level, where somebody has reached out to me that I barely know, like, hey, yeah. I saw you had James Clear in your podcast. Can you introduce me? And I'm like, no, I barely got him on my podcast, right? That yeah. so it's the it's there's a difference between the relationship being a transaction and really being a yeah, genuine I mean, relationship, like, and you know, you and know, a lot of them are transactions, which isn't a bad thing, but you have to understand yeah, the difference totally. and the nuance of each relationship. Absolutely, like you would ask me to introduce Vanessa, and I was like, I'm happy to introduce Vanessa because one, we're in the same imprint, you know, at Portfolio. I mean, she and I are friends. We've met in person a couple of times. Like you know, um, like I've always supported her her work, and so like that's the thing like and so there are certain guests where i, I have a connection with certain guests i'm like that was great i'm done thank you for sharing your information and that's it like that's the extent like cal newport and i are friends like you know i've you know hung out with him in, in washington dc cal is one of those people that like i'm willing to do stuff like that it, but you know like i said i would never be able to call tim ferris and be like yo tim here's this guy you know like i couldn't i, I mean i i couldn't get tim ferris on my podcast probably right now you know yeah. And the other thing too, that, and this again, just kind of wraps up this idea of relationship building. And then I promise I will let you go because we've already gone over time, but I knew this was going to no be worries. fascinating. Um, but I, the other thing when it comes to relationship building that people don't get, and this is something you really learn in the world of podcasting, but can be applied to any relationship building or networking scenario, is that when you're looking for any form of a mutual introduction, you have to see it from the other person's perspective, where if I said to you, hey, man, I saw you had Tim Ferriss on your podcast, do you think you could introduce me to him so I can be on his? You have to have the frame of mind to be like, would me being on Tim Ferriss's podcast be valuable to him? I mean, sure, there might be some imposter syndrome at some level, but at the end of the day, if I look at the the quality and the size of the guests that he has, just because you know him doesn't mean that the the mutual introduction is valuable. So you're calculating in your mind, well, number one, what is the quality of my relationship with Tim? But even if you had a close relationship with him, 
you have to calculate what it looks like from Tim's perspective. And Tim would be thinking, who's this guy? Like, he's great for your podcast, but I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. talking to, you know, like world leaders and experts and people that are literally changing the world as we speak. So yeah. you have to understand the, the reciprocity of the relationship. And I just see this happen all the time where people aren't calculating it from all directions and it has to be mutually beneficial for all parties. If you're seeking that mutual introduction. Totally. Yeah. So having said that, <laughs> this has been absolutely fascinating and my brain hurts from all yeah. of the ideas that you've shared and you've just, you've definitely planted the seed whereby I can come back to this, whether it's in six months or a year. And I look at how my entire creative workflow has probably changed. This was probably the impetus for it. So I thank Good. you for that. And I thank you for just, just don't a, wait six months to do it. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's when I'm going to look back on this conversation, yeah. having started going down this rabbit hole. Um, yeah, we'll but talk I just, offline a little bit and I'll tell you yeah. some more. But I, I appreciate having this debate, uh, really opening up this conversation for a lot of people doing creative work that probably aren't even paying attention to this. And they're not seeing this freight train coming because as you alluded to, I've uh, written about and I've said in print, now going to say it uh, in an audio recording, that what's happening with AI is the biggest inflection point in our history from the internet and probably even bigger. So I think that when yeah. we look at the transition from before internet, after internet, I think AI is going to be an even bigger inflection point that we don't even understand what it's going to become. So for anybody that's not paying attention, I hope after today you are paying attention. So having, having said all of that, is there any final parting words or thoughts that you feel are absolutely vital to share that we have not discussed yet? Yeah, this is actually one good way to sum all this up. Um, don't let the options in front of you blind you to the possibilities that surround you. I love that. The idea of not letting shiny object syndrome take over your entire life, which um, as we really didn't even get a chance to talk about too much and could yeah, easily that's, an entire that's part another two, conversation. It's how, how you and I uh, have definitely spent uh, many of our adult years of not beyond well, we'll managing to, ADHD we'll do, and shiny object syndrome yeah, well, and everything else. So yeah, we may have to do a second a part two then. Yeah, because that would be fascinating to crawl into that portion of your brain. And I have a feeling that you and I would uh, very much relate to a lot of the challenges that uh, we manage from that respect. Totally. But just uh, one more time, remind our listeners, if they want to learn more about what you're putting together, yeah. specifically to teach AI for creatives, where can we send okay. them, which I'll also put in the show notes. This is the URL right here. I'm popping it into the chat. It's maximizeyouroutput.com slash AI create. Mm, I love it. Um, yeah. And you can see the you know, book cover that was generated using an AI image generator, a landing page that was used, you know, because, you know, my value is in writing the book. Like, that's where I'm, you know, adding the highest value. It's like the rest of this is necessary. And then as uh, far yeah. as the, the website landing page itself, did AI also write all the code and do all the design? So I'm assuming I, you at least have to, like, create the shell no, for it and so get the domain the and shell, whatnot. Okay, for, for this one, um, AI created the, the like, main a lot of the ideas in here were based on my own notes and mem um so a lot of human input went into this one uh whereas the um search engine page i showed you unmistakable insights which that was completely done by ai um that actually literally was not like there was no human involvement in conceiving any of that other than the idea right so uh, the one other thing that I want to make sure that we add, and I'm going to make sure in the show notes that once again, we have maximizeyouroutput.com slash AI create, but you've also mm -hmm. mentioned several times this program called MEM, which is essentially an external brain combined with AI, which I am very intrigued by because I'm always trying to improve the capture process and downloading ideas from my head and getting them out of my head because that's the worst place to keep yeah. them but it's kind of a mess of various tools as it is for a lot of creatives. So where can people learn more about MEM? Because you having okay. showed this so, to me could also be a game changer. Um, so I actually have an entire course on MEM called Maximize Your Output, Maximize Your Output with MEM, but um, probably there's also a free lead magnet called, um, it, it's basically uh, how do you build your second brain in MEM? Um, and I'm you know sending you the links right now here in our chat. Uh, so, uh, you know, those are some free resources, but it basically goes into how to basically build them because MEM is very counterintuitive. It's not the way that you're used to organizing information. It's a network-based thought. It's not linear. It, so at first, it's very, it creates a lot of cognitive dissonance. And so getting past that, I think, is, is you know, part of the hurdle. But once you do, you'll never go back. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify, MEM is not your tool. You're just teaching the tool. Yeah, I'm just teaching. I wish MEM was my tool. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Um, um, yeah. 
Well, on that note, I cannot thank you enough for being here today and chatting about all things yeah, AI and creativity me. and otherwise. Uh, I know that my, well, my brain just literally hurts, and I'm excited about all the things that I'm going to learn because of this one conversation. So yeah, can't thank welcome. you enough. Absolutely. It's great. Thanks for having me.